Hi, this is Anthony Dexter-Ginelli. I want to say welcome and thank you all for joining my artist talk on my exhibition, If You Must Know, on Mata Art Gallery. I'm starting by giving a small tour of the exhibition space, then I'll answer the questions that I submitted during my Instagram takeover last week. Thank you as well to everyone who's been joining along with that. I've been uh, in quite a draining time recently, and a particularly low energy and in a bit more pain these days. So I'm just glad to still be able to give this talk um, and yeah, from the comfort of my home and in my bed. Uh, yeah, so thank you guys for joining once again, and I'll just get uh, straight into it. We're now in the 3D space that I created for the exhibition. Uh, right now, you can see a bit of a grass area. We're passing by, yeah, that looks like quite a blurred image with some, uh, yeah, uh, small video clips popping up in between. Um, being played on the, yeah, what are made to be these uh, building spaces. Then I covered the buildings with these, um, yeah, photos of my artwork, um, and then placed them inside this sort of wooded area. It looks almost like it's inside of a black box. Some of the trees are floating, some are connected to the ground, and um, some of the rocks have been enlarged. I mean, what I've tried to recreate is that there's a street on a hill and inside this sort of fenced off area is a wooded area. There's houses on either side. On one side, it's more, um, yeah, I guess you could say uh, industrial, more urban, that there's just pavement on the other side, no, um, yeah, no grass. Uh, and yeah, this part you wouldn't be able to normally see just from the street, but I wanted to make it more open like it seemed like it was more accessible or like it was easier to get to than it actually was in real life and um, yeah so there would be like you see this fence there would be some fence that surrounding this entire area and um, and also the bottom there was covered in graffiti now we're passing by more of the more of these buildings these houses that are on the other side and again there's these popping up small video clips of me inside of a bathtub with the same textures from my artworks being projected on me, but the same, you can see a, a snake being projected on there too. And the snake is my partner's snake. Uh, his name is George and I use, uh, he's, I'm lucky enough to have him to give me all the uh, snake sheds that I use on these pieces. Um, and yeah, when you get closer up or even in the background now, you can see the detail work of what the, the pieces really are. And that is sort of my main artistic practice. Doing these things in 3D, I'm very new to. And uh, because I was doing something virtually, I really wanted to place these pieces, not just as if you had seen them in a gallery, but to show the, the benefits of using a, a virtual space and to actually get something more that you would be able to get in physical. Uh, and now we're at the point in the video where we've gone up into the air, landed back down again. This is a good chance to talk about what the, um, the real narrative behind this was. Um, yeah, so like I've said in many of the um, texts around this, I've recreated this sunken uh, river beneath the city. It was the middle of the night when I had fallen eight meters on there, down to the ground. Uh, I landed on... Um, just one ankle and it took the entire impact of the blow and then all my uh, bones in that ankle got pulverized. It, I was very drunk when this had happened and it, I didn't really feel it. I thought that I could just stand back up again and then yeah, walk out of there. But as soon as I started to stand back up, I fell straight back onto the ground. And I spent the whole night then coming in and out of consciousness, seeing different, yeah, like visions, um, trying to cross back and forth between the uh, river, getting wet, um, screaming the whole night for, for help, uh, and only being found the, the very next day. Uh, so I wanted to create something in here. Like I said, I was not aware of everything that was going on when these events had happened. Uh, I sort of wanted to inject as much of 
what could be more closer to what I had experienced than what exactly was reality into, yeah, into the works here. So I had a lot of moments of being calm under the water, being like comforted. When I'm showing these small video clips, that's sort of, yeah, a good emotional way to indicate what I had actually felt with the water. It was like a very big um, spectrum that was going between feeling extremely calm and extremely like disturbed by the water as well. Um, I would wake up with it from the point of passing out with the water rushing over my face. And it's it's not the cleanest river. There was a lot of yeah actual like dirt and sewage that was flowing through there too. And that bothered me for, yeah, a very long time, especially now in the past, um, yeah, couple of years since I really lost all uh, mobility. Uh, or a lot of my function has been taken away and I've been much more confined to, yeah, to being at home uh, is when the PTSD from these events have really hit me. And for a while, I couldn't even get my hair wet without getting flashbacks. And um, so also with the way that these video clips are introduced, I wanted to give some sense of what these flashbacks were like, but to take better control of them and yeah, a lot of people say it's very comforting to see something like this. And yeah, I want to to address that uh, and give this sort of duality of it that uh, water was something for the past many years that I had a very poor relationship with. And after going through the PTSD treatment, uh, I'm yeah on a better side of it. But I wanted to show this like inundation or being enveloped by something and that if we look back at the actual events was yeah kind of disgusting and i wanted to make it more beautiful with yeah we're not even beautiful i just want to make it more calming and comforting and that's what i try to do in pretty much all my works and even the ones on paper so i want to translate that into something that worked well in a 3d and like virtual space and um, yeah that's a quick introduction to the space why i created certain things the the way that i did and what the general like emotions and feelings that i wanted to put into this there's of course a lot more that's difficult to give in just a short uh, a short interview like that or a short um, talk like this especially because i want to get to to answer more questions that uh, have been submitted through here. And yeah, so this is a good place to go to the, the questions because we're now going through um, some real life footage of the, the space. Uh, so you can see the contrast between how the space, the real life place looked like and what I created. Um, and yeah, so some things to think about as this part of the video is playing as well. And yeah, then I'll start reading off with the questions. The I got quite a few. Uh, so yeah, thank you again to everyone for submitting. The first two here are yeah quite quick and technical. Uh, what software do I use? I used uh, Blender, and there were some elements that I downloaded myself, but other ones that uh, yeah I created exactly from uh, from scratch. I thought it would have been great if people were able to walk through the space themselves or some sort of, uh, that was able to be done in some sort of VR way. But uh, yeah, unfortunately I couldn't do that for this exhibition. So then I made the video walk through of that. Uh, where did I get the real life footage? Um, yeah, I asked my sister's friend, Allison Moore. Thank you, Allison. Um, she went down and I gave her an exact path of, yeah, what the video that's playing right now, for example, is what I had to crawl in order to get rescued that night from where I was picked up the, the next morning, from where I dropped in. And, and I wanted her to walk back during the daylight. Also, this is, when this happened to me, it was in the middle of uh, summer. It, I still had a bit of, or like close to hypothermia because I was so wet. 
Um, so I wanted to get in the winter instead. So like, yeah, this is what my body was actually going through or like what the conditions would have been more like. If you imagine being in something cold like this and also very dead. And that's what I wanted was that the real life footage looked more dead than, um, yeah, the stuff that the virtual stuff that I made that should feel much more, much more alive. Then um, the third question, when I was found, what was the first thought or emotion going through my head? Yeah, that's a very intense question, let's say. Um, yeah, I was just, I think it had been, I went into the river probably around like one or two in the morning, and then it must have been about eight when I was found, so about six to seven hours. Um, uh, yeah, I was, of course, screaming the entire time. So my voice was almost gone. So actually, before I was found um, and the sun came out, I thought to myself, like, okay, I don't really have that much energy at all left. So I sort of need to give it all into my screams right now. Uh, and yeah, so I gave some last, like, helps out. And then someone finally came out to to find me. So of course it was a, a big relief because yeah, I, was in, I mean, I was still in shock. I wasn't feeling, I really wasn't feeling pain at that point. It was rather the, uh, yeah, just the emotional exhaustion from being there the whole night and physical exhaustion. I mean, the way that the, the place is set up, the, there, yeah, it's a drainage stream, drainage river. So if it had rained that night, then it, pretty much the, that river would have flooded and I would have been swept into the, the tunnel, um, where it has happened to people before and they have actually survived it, but uh, which I've yeah found out after reading about it. But uh, yeah, I didn't think that that was going to be something that I would survive. So of course it was just... A giant sense of relief. I think it's a very obvious answer, but it was the the first thought and emotion that I had going through my head. Um, then I got a question: What inspires my work and in life? Uh, it's mostly it's mostly trying to get some control over. Okay, with my work and my practice, it's mostly trying to get some control over my. Uh, how I deal with who I am today uh, because I was like a very active person and you know it didn't happen immediately that I wasn't able to to walk anymore that's something that came just in the past uh, few years that yeah after the condition got sort of worse and worse but uh, yeah I sort of I did lose some sense of mobility from when this started, like I got some reconstruction and I got several years where I could walk, walk all right, or I had like normal, somewhat normal mobility, but I was like pushing it way too far during that, uh, that period. Um, and yeah, I felt like a, a statue pretty much. So I was living in Rome at the time when uh, I got into going to these, um, uh, they're called like monumental cemeteries. I live next to one. So I would just sort of go there um, and I would see all these statues and I thought that I felt like a statue as well. So that's where I start the, um, that's where I start using the more, where the figures come from, right? Cause I want them to be like statues and sort of still and lifeless. And then uh, sort of all the layering on top of it is what's supposed to make it come more alive. And then you're supposed to see yeah, this like statue figure that's under many layers of water. So then also with the gold, these things on top, it's supposed to look like it's sort of struggling underneath the water, but overall still calm. Uh, so that's what is inspiring my practice today. Um, and yeah, there's some other questions that ask a bit about before, so I'll leave the rest of the answer for, for that. Um, other than this exhibition, what are the works inspired by? Um, so I grew up with my uh, 
grandmother who's from Panama. And it, her house was just like, yeah, it was incredible. It, unfortunately, it burnt down in a fire and most of what she had was lost. But when I was a kid, I spent all my summers with, uh, with her and she had the most, yeah, incredible traditional artworks or just like artworks in general in her house. Um, and yeah, sort of the national art form, especially from the region where she's from in Panama is these uh, molas, I'm wearing one on my shirt now. But the, um, yeah, the red that's normally used for this are, yeah, I find very inspiring that they're, I guess you could say like the opposite of water, but they're so deep. It's almost like, yeah, like blood, like human water. Uh, but I was, even before any of this happened, I was always like so entranced by them. Um, so this color red I use a lot in the, yeah, the works that I have as well. Um, so I think I, I definitely do draw a lot of, from, yeah, the art that I grew up around. Um, she was also very Catholic, of course. Uh, and these images of the saints sort of stayed with me as well. Um, or just how the, yeah, she was like viewing the saints as these like guardians. Um, so that was something in particular that I wanted to, yeah, that I think a lot about it in my work as well. Then, uh, yeah, we have quite a few questions here about uh, disability, which I'm very happy to answer too. The first one is, do I think accessibility has become more prominent after the start of the pandemic? or more performative. Um, yeah, I will say something like, personally, is that before the start of the pandemic, I was not, I was still very much viewing myself as able-bodied because I had a lot of my mobility and I think I was very blind to what was going on. So I think that uh, I'm yeah, maybe not the best person to answer this, but I can definitely say that after I got to see it from a very unique perspective of like, I just became sort of more fully disabled in uh, during the start of the pandemic. And I got to see everyone going more towards like, because everybody lost their mobility at that point. I got to see everyone going towards this uh, online exhibitions, access these kinds of things where suddenly the playing field was sort of leveled, that I was like protected in that, that once I, once, things started opening back up again, I got to see really how big the shift is in my lifestyle and all the things that I was not able to do anymore. And I think it's been harder for people after the, like, after the pandemic um, to see a need that, okay, well, I, what we had back then was actually good because we were, like, we could give people all this access but uh, now we're too excited to be back at things in person that were really, they were like, why would we ever go back to something like that? That's what my experience has been like. Um, so I don't even know if I want to say that it is performative because I just think it's under, even more undervalued afterwards. Uh, yeah. The next question is along the same lines. What barriers do artists with disabilities still face in the arts? Uh, if you had a look through my, uh, if you click on some of the works, then it will take you to a page where uh, there should be like a price list. Um, but there is no price list because, yeah, I can't sell any of my works because it goes against the, um, yeah, the disability benefits that I need to survive. Uh, and it's very different everywhere you go, particularly in the US. I think that there is no like middle system that you can't be like partially working. Uh, it's like either all or, or nothing. Um, but here in Denmark, at least, even if you are like partial, allowed to like partially work, um, you can't sell anything because you can't be working for yourself. And that's a huge problem for artists because even if it's not like uh, the actual money coming in from uh, selling like we can't even apply for grants and applying for grants are like the even if it's not the money of it it's like the biggest 
stamp of approval that you can get on your your practice these like a uh, long-term working grants and we're just yeah completely blocked from doing that i mean i can't even go to uh yet to art school and get a bfa if i wanted to because yeah my body couldn't handle it and they wouldn't be able to give me the same like access needs to get something like this but there's just no, no alternative either that's uh yeah you don't get the recognition if you haven't gone to the school here either so for me those are the two biggest uh, barriers i mean of course there's the like yeah these are more uh, systemic but there's all the physical barriers i mean it's a huge huge topic to go through but if i i think those are two surprising ones that people don't really consider that much uh what do i want to people people that take away from when they encounter my artworks. Um, yeah, I think that it's, uh, I just want people to get sort of a calming feeling um, because that's, that is what it is for me as well. I mean, like sitting down and placing all these uh, pieces onto the artwork, um, as particularly the ending part where I'm placing the yeah metallic squares on takes like, yeah, almost could take several months. But it's, it's really meditative and it's really calming for me. And it's been a really good way for me to deal with uh, yeah, a lot of the health and body things that I've been going through. So I want that to come off for other people as well. Um, just because I use this as a way for me to deal with my health issues. Uh, I don't want people to see, which is what has happened recently, even like a situation where I've uh yeah been put into yeah actually something quite dangerous as far as like housing um the person who put me in this situation said to me like uh yeah i know this sucks for you but just put it all into your arts like i don't want the fact that i have some sort of like means of uh dealing with pain and difficult things around me to be like a justification for, for why i should be in worse situations um then uh yeah the next question do i have any artistic goals as an artist with a disability um yeah i think my artistic goals are just to be able to show my work as much as possible uh, and i think having a disability really prevents me from doing this like for the reasons that i had described before about not being able to sell work like you know it's just a lot of things are blocked off from us when you're taken out of these like monetary means of what art is, which I think, yeah, which I'm totally against, but it just sucks that all the ways of, uh, you're getting to show my work I'm blocked off from. So I would just like to be able to show it as much as possible. What themes did my previous artworks focus on and how has it shifted since the incident? This is actually very interesting because, uh, I studied art in high school, then I wanted to move to Denmark so bad that I just be, yeah, signed up to, yeah, not study arts and I studied, yeah, culture and uh, some business even, but uh, I sort of forgot about, yeah, what I loved so much about art in the first place for those years because I, yeah, I was focusing on sort of just sort of like making a new life or making a different life. Then once this incident happened and I was then stuck uh yeah at my parents house for three months waiting for like the um, uh, yeah to be safe to fly after having such an intense surgery that they were worried about like blood clots um yeah i was literally just like stuck in a room on a couch in immense pain and uh i had nothing to do uh, i tried like doing some studies but i couldn't even read so i actually got back into or in particularly like into drawing during that period. Um, and then I was just exploring like some portraits and stuff like this, but I don't think I, I wasn't exploring like themes in my previous artwork before the incidents because my practice as it is now all came from the incident. Um, I mean, in high school I was doing more ceramics and I was making things like, uh, I don't know, ceramic mats from Carnival or something like this. And I wasn't going that deep also. Yeah. I didn't understand myself that well. So going through this, like, and ending up on the art practice that I have now, 
only comes from the incident and from getting like a much better understanding of who I am as well. And the final question, has my disability shifted my direction from previous artworks? Uh, yeah. It, I mean, it's uh, very similar to the, <laughs> to the last question. Um, maybe I wasn't thinking so much about my disability when it, yeah, so actually I think I can divide those two questions up pretty clearly instead of like, I'm thinking about the incident and then when I became disabled because after the incident, like I said, I still had some level of mobility for some years where I could still live somewhat normally, but then it wasn't until 2019 or 2020 that I became more like unable to walk and severely mobility limited. Uh, and after that, I began, like I've always been doing these works on paper and I have sort of, um, and I still am doing them, of course, like that's the main basis for my practice. But I'm I, after the disability, I think I got much more interested in looking at video or virtual works or using my body in different ways, like particularly with the one that I did with my friend, Sarah Sasha Aisha West, with all the, yeah, the, the small video clips that you see coming in and out of the, uh, the exhibition tour. I've been super interested into like, yeah, my body was so like active before and I never had like a problem with, with body image, but uh, my body changed like yeah, quite a lot since, uh, since the disability and I wanted to, I definitely do want to in the future explore that in much more ways. Um, so doing this thing with the, the water in the bathtub, like, I mean, I use my body as the prop there and uh, I mean it was for at the time I thought it was just like a way to yeah do what my PTSD treatment was doing and get a better relationship with water but I didn't realize that at the same time I was connecting so much more with my body as well um, and I'm also thinking about my particular body when I'm making my even the works on paper now too um, yeah so I think a bigger connection on my body is how I'd say that it has, uh, it's shifted. Um, yeah, I think I've given, a quite a long, uh, extensive, uh, talk now. And yeah, I can see just by even giving this, even my face probably looks like more energized. And yeah, I think I've realized some things that I was maybe not so aware of before either. So this has been, uh, yeah, like fun and interesting process for me. So uh, yeah, thank you guys for, for watching and also thank you for everyone who submitted the questions. I'm uh, yeah, just super grateful that people get to see my work and that I get to explain these things about myself and uh, learn more about my artwork at the same time. Uh, so thank you.